put my watch there so that I respect the time and don't go uh, too far. Uh, you've had a long, stimulating day judging by the um, workshops that I've been in, uh, so I'm sure you're, you're, you're tired. But it, it's an honour for me to be here and to be in such informed, dynamic, you know, company, I would say. Um, it's nice to talk to a few people. I was in a workshop this morning with Paula and Mia and other people here that stressed the importance of bringing something of yourself to the classroom. I, I think that's an important idea. I don't normally talk about myself in talks, but I'm going to a little bit. <laughs> I have permission from this morning. I'm going to take you back to 1972, September 1972, when I was starting a PGCE in Durham. I'm hoping one or two of you at the back are saying to yourselves, PGC 1972? Mm. Mm. <laughs> I thought he was older than that. <laughs> <laughs> People at the front are thinking the opposite. They say, no, PGC 1972, he must have been a mature student. <laughs> Believe me. I went there to do an English PGC, and I sat for the welcoming lecture, and I found a piece of paper on the seat, and I looked at it, and it was about a drama course, and it was very informally written, and so on, and my friend next to me, who happened to be called Mick O'Sullivan, which is irrelevant, but I'm telling you his name, <laughs> it gives it sort of a bit of, it is truthful, said to me, do, do you fancy going to that? It was voluntary. I said, nah. And he said to me, there might be a lot of women there. <laughs> I apologise for the sexist remarks. I, see it. I didn't say it, he said it. It was early 1972. And so I said, um, all right. There was something, actually, I wish I'd kept it. I am a bit of a hoarder, but I didn't hoard that piece of paper. There was something about it that was a bit different. It said something about you'll learn a lot about yourself. You may or may not learn anything about tea. It was intriguing. I went along, not sure what to expect, sort of slightly nervous that we'd be put in parts. And my, my knowledge of theatre was as literature, terribly, you know. Um, we went in, there was a, a man sitting, um, a little slight man looking very, like, almost like a gnome sitting in the middle. <laughs> we all sat around quietly, nobody said anything. He stood up, got us in pairs. First thing I remember so vividly all that time ago, tell your partner about your journey to work, he said. And then the other one, tell it back as if you were that person. And few other exercises. Then he got us into pairs and said, imagine, I'm giving you the short version. You live in a, 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 a town and you find there are rats in your house. You go out one day and meet a neighbour and you discover in conversation that they have the same problem. So we started doing this improvisation. Then the twos got into fours. Then he quickly manoeuvred us into eight. Before we were a big crowd worried about our rats. <clears throat> then suddenly he said, in narrative, and that group decided, they were so worried about this, they went to the council to complain. <laughs> and he sat, and we went in, and the improvisation continued. It was living through spontaneous improvisation. Now, some of you may have guessed um, the person was Gavin Bolton, and that started me off. I mean, the whole session and then weekly sessions. It started off on a lifelong, you know, friendship and professional, you know, acquaintance with, with, with Gavin and I owe an awful lot to him. Dorothy as well for me, but mostly Gavin. And for somebody who'd spent most of his education life, including university, being either either literally looking out of the window or metaphorically looking out of the window <laughs> while things went on and then catching up afterwards for exams by learning outside the teaching space. This was a revelation to me, to actually get on your feet and be active. Plus, at that time, there was something inspiring about the critical edge. We were, you know, groups confronting authority. 
in that, um, what was a Pied Piper enactment. And it went on and on. I, I, I did think I might claim to, that, that, that person on the left there, you know, I thought I might get away with that. I'm not in that picture. <laughs> but then I thought little of it, because he's wearing sandals with socks. <laughs> Even I wasn't so sartorially challenged. Though <laughs> no, my wife might tell you differently. But one of the things that Gavin said to us at that time was he contrasted this experiential living through drama, he called it, with performance. He alluded to the Pine Piper and he said, and this is different from dressing up, and it's funny the things that stay with you, and running around as rats, as opposed to a meaningful confrontation and probing the meaning, and it's a very dark uh, tale, the, the, the Pine Piper. So it's interesting that, um, we, I'm going to talk a little bit more um, about the brief history of drama and education in the UK, where we got this very odd now, looking back, divide between drama and theatre. But I think it's an interesting uh, notion uh, to, to, to look at, because I think we've got, we've got well past it, but it has interesting lessons. So my introductory comments. That wasn't an introduction, that was a preface. <laughs> <laughs> this is the introduction, I'd better keep an eye on that. Um, I've got the sort of nice task, in a way, of exploring a concept. I like the word exploring, it's nice and fluid and sort of... Uh, <clears throat> so I want to say, first of all, it's not a blank page I'm working with. There was the seminar in autumn, the symposium, unfortunately I couldn't be here. We had the talk this morning. Um, we've had all the papers and the workshops, so I'm not bringing something new here. Um, it's ongoing work that we're, we're in dialogue about the notion of perform, performative, performativity, whatever. Yeah. The other thing to say is, I'm not pursuing a single definition. I don't believe in them. No, I do believe in them in some context, but you know, Sometimes we can operate with fluid concepts and not be too concerned with drawn type parameters. I'm going to draw on a range of writers, but I'm not really going to mention too many of them or put too many quotes up. I say that in advance. I wouldn't like you to go away with, the, with thinking that I've said anything that's my own. No, no. I, would, you know, I suppose what I'm doing is putting pieces together connecting things. Um, I did think I ought to put a bibliography at the end, and maybe I'll, I'll, I'll attach that later. I haven't done that yet. Um, <clears throat> I'm aware of the danger of overloading the concept of performative. You know, the danger is that you take a concept and pile onto it all the good things about teaching and learning that you want to. Um, so, having said I'm aware of that, I'm going to do it. No, I'm not going to do it. But I, I want to make you aware that I'm aware of that sort of danger. Uh, and I come from a, a more general perspective rather than a, an NFL perspective. That will be apparent as we uh, go on. So, if we say, what's the broad field we might draw on? to inform the notion of the concept of performative teaching and learning. Well, it's very wide, and it's wider than that. And I've heard threads in some of the workshops, obviously drama, theatre, performance theatre, philosophy of language, philosophy of mind, art, aesthetics, teaching and learning, and you could add more. So you might say to me, so which of those, I said it to myself when I was thinking about this, which of those should I concentrate on? And I thought, all of them. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but I'm doing it in a very broad brush way, okay? Not in fine detail. And that has its risks. I may have misjudged it. It may be like bouncing from one thing to another and not drawing out enough for you. Actually, I'm less concerned about that, having sat in some of the workshops, because there's a, lot of, there's a lot of informed people here, and that makes me feel good, really, 
Because one thing we all share, I'm sure we, sh we share a lot in common, but one thing we all share is the sort of inappropriateness of this style for real deep learning to go on. <laughs> you know, we all believe in active learning, that's why we're here. So there's a little irony, but yes, I do think there's a place for this kind of address. But it's often more helpful if you're telling people things they already know, but in a slightly different way, and coming at concepts in a different direction. So I was reassured by, by the, 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 the workshops, rather than thinking, oh God, I've got nothing to say to them now. Um, so I'm, I think you can come at this performative teaching and learning from two directions. And quite rightly, because of the history here in the, the, where we are and what's attracted you here, you come at it from a modern language teaching perspective. And a, an umbrella, I knew I said I wouldn't quote too many writers, but this is Manfred. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm allowed to put him in. An umbrella term to describe forms of foreign language teaching which derive from the arts and their corresponding culturally specific pedagogical practices. I think that's a, a nice kind of definition, if you like, a nice account, and it's very helpful. I can see how helpful that term is in the modern language community to, you know, vitalize things together. I'm coming from the other direction. And <clears throat> I suppose, fairly ambitiously, I'm saying this notion of formative teaching and learning is really, really useful for the drama community and for you know, teaching and learning in general outside the parameters of modern language teaching. And of course, I'm hoping that the comments I'll make are helpful and informative in that direction. And the other thing that uh, uh, occurred to me is we have lots of terms, like drama for learning, dialogic process, drama, etc., etc. And I reminded us a quote from Wittgenstein, a new word is like a fresh seed sown, seed sown on the ground of the discussion. Quite nice, that. I mean, the probably the form of teaching and learning doesn't seem like a new term to you now, but I think it is newish still. It's growing, it's starting to take root, and it's starting to yeah. flourish, and I think it's useful. So, those areas that I described, you know, drama and education, performance theory, language, philosophy of mind, art, aesthetics, teaching and learning, are the structure for my, what I'm going to say. And I'm going to be brief about each one, as you can say. This uh, history of drama and education, I have to glance at my watch because I could probably spend the rest of the conference talking about that because I think it's really interesting and really informative. But I'm disciplining myself to one or two sort of brief issues to do with this peculiar thing that happened in the UK primarily. I mean, I don't think in other countries in Europe, certainly not Australia, my colleagues there tell me, it, or Canada. It, 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 the, 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 the divisions didn't become so strong. I'm sorry, can you see it from back here? No. No. No, no, no. I can't even see it from up there. <laughs> but I'll talk you through it. It's, it's a diagram that shows the separation of theatre and drama coming in one direction. And the middle is the famous quote by Brian Way that says, Drama is about experience. Theatre is about communication with an audience. And then it comes back together again. And it looks as if we've gone from one version of... We've had a journey that separated drama and theatre in a peculiar way. And I don't mean drama in the way that it's used by theatre people. I mean this peculiar drama and education notion that derives from dramatic playing. I'll say a little bit more about that. But we got a separation and then a coming together. But the point of the diagram, the point of the detail that you can't see, is that we didn't come back to the same place. We came back to a richer understanding of drama and a richer understanding of theatre by just looking over the wall at theatre practice and what really was going on. 
Because in the top right hand product, what was being rejected by the drama and education people in the starting in the 50s in the UK with Peter Slade, then through the 60s and the early 70s, what was being rejected was a very superficial view of theatre with children where they just do what they're told. It's an authoritarian pro They're mouthing words that don't mean anything to them. They're being regimented. And there are some lovely quotes from 50s authors that talk about the danger of creating bombastic little boasters. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Peter Ford. Um, somebody else talked about, you know, child stars eager to wave at their parents and not understanding anything else. And this was contrasted with the dramatic playing mode that was, when I started, all spontaneous improvisation at a living through pace. Very difficult to do. Um, and intriguingly, a lot of the drama practice in the very early days, it's the most social activity we have. A lot of the lessons in the, in the sort of early 60s started getting into a space on your own. What, what, what an irony. You know, you did drama by yourself a lot of the time. <laughs> Often in PE kit. You know, so uh, the history is, and uh, the pictures and stuff are really interesting, but I mustn't say in this too much. As we moved on, partly the influence of Dorothy Hefker and Gavin Bolton, drama, the importance of form and structure, looking at systems of significance, <coughs> getting informed by theatre writing and literary writing, and not just by theories of child play and psychology, interesting though that they were. And we got an increasing recognition on the other side of communal nature of the theatre, fluid concepts of acting and rehearsal. I mean, when I started drama in education in the early 70s, <coughs> rehearsal, you didn't use that term. You didn't use the term acting. You certainly didn't use the term performing. We used to debate whether a bit of showing was all right. <laughs> <laughs> showing the drama. <laughs> now, what? So, those are the two, you know, um, um, polarities, if you like: superficial theatre and engaging drama and education. Often had a, an ideological sort of message going on. Um, but we come past that. Um, and we have more inclusive practice now, rightly so. I want to just focus on the term self-expression there. Um, one of the things that was going on in the early drama and education practice, I mean pre-Bolton and Hecate, is that everything that children created was thought to be okay. <laughs> because it was creative. <laughs> and because it was self-expression. And you can get away with an awful lot if you say imagination, creativity, self-expression. And it sort of smooths over any questions about what are they learning, what are they understanding, and so on. So I think progressive education took, you know, a little bit of a, long, a wrong turn in some ways. Um, in a way, self-expression should be put in brackets there, because of course self-expression is really important, but it's what the consequences of the, the, the views are. So, I'm going to move on. Coming from, from that, did you see the deliberate mistake there? I'm not moving on yet from drama and education. <laughs> These are the key, key issues. The notion of inclusive practice, small scale, large scale. The limitations of so the term self-expression or the dangers and other associated conflict. And we get a more sophisticated conception of it. This is the moving on bit to the performance theory. And um, in one of the work not shops, performance theory that came up. Again, I'm just going to touch on it and bounce away. But writers who start looking at anthropology and rituals and sports and start looking at the term performance 
going on in the 70s, but drama and education practice being very insular, didn't look over its, you know, and I, I, yeah, I was part of that, and I include myself as being an insular, I'm not criticising others. I think we were insular and didn't look over the hedge of what was going on elsewhere in theatre and so on. Um, but some of the performance, I just made that diagram to sort of summarise some of, I went back to some of those books. This notion that all human activity can be seen as performance in some way. The notion that we present ourselves in everyday life, to quote um, Goffman, I think it is, and so on. Um, I think that's interesting to think about, but I find more helpful the notion where we look at performance as something special. And Manfred listed this morning concepts of presence, spatiality, uh, rhythm, emergent sound, ways of separating out performance from ourselves, everyday activity. I find that um, fruitful. And I take, you see, I said I would bounce from one to the other, but I take from some of this the notion of heightened consciousness in the notion of performative. That there's something bracketed and framed and special, if, if you like. That there's a, more of a reflective element. And that there is something about framing going on, which are, of course, also aesthetic and theatre concepts. There's going to be a lot of overlap here. So, moving on to language. Um, I think, yes, it was, we had speech act theory come up in one of the workshops. I know you weren't all in the same workshop as me, so I won't keep going on about it. But I found that really interesting, that, you know, there's overlap in, in the thinking. In speech activity, the term performative associated with Austen, um, sentences not only passive, passively describing reality, but changing the social reality they're describing. I think that's fruitful. I also want to talk about more general view, views about language and meaning. It's gone very quiet. I'm sorry the jokes have dried up. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting a bit heavy, isn't it? <laughs> it gets worse, believe me. <laughs> Two views of language. I think I don't need to hammer this home. There's people are so familiar with this. You can't sort of read theory these days without getting this. Instead of the traditional view that language is a disembodied tool that you just use to get things done and has very little to do with like, identity and self and so on, where we operate as hermetically sealed, strict definitions, etc. But contemporary views of language to modern theorists embody, and I think a lot of them owe a debt to Wittgenstein, that it's more open, fluid, unstable. It's not opaque, because if it was opaque, we wouldn't be able to communicate with, with each other at all. Translucent is a slightly better word. And intuitively, because we talk and people understand what we're saying, intuitively we think language is totally transparent, because we operate as if it is. But we only have to think about confusions and ambiguities and so on, and we see that the right-hand view is right. I think language acquisition will be, you, most of you will know more about language acquisition than I do. But contrasting a view of language to do with attaching labels and learning rules to language in social context. So there's a pure linguistic and a socio-cultural contrast going on here. Language is acquired not in the role of spectator but through use. Being exposed to a flow of language is not nearly so important as using it in the midst of doing, says Bruno. Children learn language by learning how to behave in situations, not by learning rules about what to say. Why have I picked those? That's Halliday. Why have I put those quotes? Because they have that sort of action, performative element in them. And to go to language and meaning, 
I suppose the traditional view of language. I mean, Wittgenstein was great. He, he, he evolved one philosophy and then thought he had nothing to say and abandoned philosophy. I mean, if I stopped writing when I had nothing to say, I would have had no career. <laughs> 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 he just said, I've said what I want to say, I've sold everything, I'm going away to teach. Then he started, it wouldn't leave him alone, and he realised he'd made a big mistake, so he wrote a whole second philosophy. And his first philosophy was trying to account for how language has meaning by attaching words to labels. And his second philosophy was the embedded view that language has meaning in use and you'll be aware of that, I'm sure. We can draw a boundary for a special purpose, but it does not mean that step to make the concept usable. I mean, I'm talking about, about the importance of a fluid concept of language. But of course, that doesn't help if you go for an interview and somebody says to me, I see here you've put down um, performative teaching and learning. Would you like to tell me what that means? Uh, no, man, it's all, <laughs> it's all fluid, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know why I fall into a cockney hippie. <laughs> That's a stereotype. <laughs> Never mind. But, 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 so we can draw a boundary. You know, if we went into an interview, we draw a boundary. It says, actually, it means this, 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 and this. But allow ourselves the intellectual freedom to explore the concept. Language was thought in the first version to have meaning simply by a picture in the outside world, much like the all pervasive camera phone. <laughs> so those, I became fond of those little symbols. I only put those there because they were copyright free. <laughs> you know what it's like when you're doing a PowerPoint. But then I became, but then I became quite fond of them because the idea is one focuses on the individual. Meaning is to do with the individual attaching labels and the other puts us in context in a community. And hasn't doesn't education still, despite all the rhetoric of, 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 of you know sophisticated teaching and learning, still think individually, you know, with its testing and its comparing and so on. Individually rather than communally. And I'm attaching the word performance to the community either. So we've got an emphasis on the social, an emphasis on negotiation and meaning, active use, and context. I'm, do, I'm not doing too bad. So let's take, take a step further down into the depths, and then we'll come out a bit. <laughs> Philosophy of mind dualism. It used to drive me mad. Not that long ago, actually. I don't think I understood it for a long time. I used to read it. It is a bit of a cliche, isn't it? You read about philosophical dualism and mind-body separation. I used to think they're making it sound like they can't cut somebody's head off. You know, you know, you'd, you'd read about dualism, and then it makes perfect sense to talk about mind and body. So what's it about? Well, I find Wittgenstein helpful here because he was more interested in the consequences of use of terms, not prescribing how we use them. And I think in, in, in education, and I think this came up uh, this morning, with this, I mean, mind and body, they're just words. They're just constructs that we use. They don't attach to labels. They just, we just use them. And sometimes they're helpful, but sometimes they deceive us into neglecting other aspects of, 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 of the person. And that's been a theme in all the workshops, I think. Neglecting the body, <coughs> neglecting feeling, neglecting the overall person. I see performative as an outward concept that challenges the inward term that has influenced approaches to teaching and learning. <gasps> Challenging the inward term. It sounds very much like crude behaviorism. And it's not intended to be. Wittgenstein was accused of being a behaviorist. He was, as you probably know, one of the most mystical and spiritual of philosophers. So he believed very much in the inner life and the inner world. So how do we reconcile these two things? He was very interested in language operating. 
And he said that the superficial grammar of the language implies that words like understanding and intention refer to something that is largely internal. And that's right, we speak of thoughts crossing one's mind or is grasping the gist of what someone is saying, as if these are internal events. But look, if we need to determine whether someone intended to hurt us, it doesn't make sense to say that we could resolve the matter if we could look inside at their real intention. When you say it that way, that seems really obvious. But yet the word intention and understanding takes us internally. It just, it deceives us. We confirm their intention by looking outwardly at further evidence from the patterns in their lives, from the way they live. That is not to deny that people have internal lives. And sometimes the term embodiment helps to capture that rich sense of what subjectivity entails. We need to thicken explanations of behaviour by reference to the inside or what is behind. That's why it's such an important metaphor term in our language. But again, I see this as going from the individual to the social and the community. If we don't allow the words to trap us into thinking of understanding, for example, purely as something that's going on inside. Let me go into that in more detail. Again, if we're in an interview and somebody says to us, tell me what you think understanding means, we should just say, it's a word. We're not going to get very far. But I think, in a way, that's what Wittgenstein was. Think of understanding as a word and how it operates and how it might deceive us. Now, with education, two senses of understanding. Understanding, it's an event. It's an all or nothing affair. It's coming to see clearly. Come on, have you got it yet? It conjures up a certain pedagogical model to me. That. Of course there is understanding in that sense. But it's not the whole story about understanding. There's another notion of understanding as an extended process of refining and deepening. Seeing things from new angles, making fresh connections, seeing more de depth. I think making fresh connections is a kind of outward notion. It's making that thing connect with that and seeing things in a new light. So, so the importance of context comes up. Once you take the individual and you stop going inwards, uh, <clears throat> The importance of context, the importance of a holistic view of human beings, that's been part of the, 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 the conference I know, and a need for a rich conception of understanding. That doesn't replace the first one with the second one, but sees that the first one has limitations, if that's all we see. Come on, listen, have you got it? I've explained it to you three times, and I've explained to that class that four times, and they still don't get it. You know, it's that view of pedagogy. Well, there may be something going wrong, you might think. Art aesthetics. So much to say, and so little time <laughs> to say it. <laughs> and am I allowed to plug? I think so. Uh, I've spent much of the last year editing a big um, compendium for Rampage, one of their handbooks, 37 contributors, edited a colleague from the United States and a colleague from Australia. And that's been really fascinating to see. You know, they weren't commissioned to, to say, write this, write that. What's view of the arts? It's interesting how consistent some of the themes are. You know, a, a, an expansive view of the arts, including in education, high art and popular art, um, importance of lifelong learning, uh, a lot about spirituality, interestingly enough. Um, but one of the things, the interesting, not quite a paradox, but art is part of life. It seems such an obvious thing to say, but I think it hasn't always been, art hasn't always been seen in that way. We've had a tradition of a very formalist, separatist view of the arts. Some people blame Kant for this, but maybe unfair, maybe a misunderstanding of Kant. Dewey, John Dewey, the educator, called it a museum concept of art. 
where art is sort of somewhere, and it's not just to do with high art and popular art, somehow that art is out there and isn't part of life, you know, isn't part of the mainstream of life. Seems daft, but a lot of theorists, you know, spoke about art, wrote about art in that way. But this is the however, that's sort of obvious art is part of life. I think this is interesting, that the notion of art space is important. Paradoxically, there is a sense in which engagement with art takes us out of life's mainstream in order to engage with life more fully. There's a sort of feeling of taking time out and that we simplify to explore complexity. And I find that quite, and it, it, it ties back, I think, to some of the performance theory notions where the anthropologists were looking at um, what was going on. Of course, the aesthetic dimensions of experience with art provide us ability to enhance perception and intensify experience. And what we might call aesthetic knowledge, I don't think the terms are that important, um, but when you combine cognitive, emotional, sensory understanding and bodily awareness and so on, um, it's puzzling to educators and systems raised in more atomistic and cognitive dominant traditions. That's the struggle we, you know, if you weren't there, you don't understand it kind of thing, you know. Uh, it's very hard in our cognitive driven, narrow, results oriented world to kind of persuade people of the value of the aesthetic dimensions of teaching work. So you'll see that we're coming sort of to, not a conclusion, but a drawing together. Those were the themes that I talked about on the left, and those are the sort of notions that I was trying to um, distill from them, if you like. So, a little bit more. Performative teaching and learning. Um, I think it's helpful both for drama and the arts. Of, of course it's helpful for modern foreign languages, but I'm not really qualified to say much about that. Um, I'm so interested in modern foreign languages uh, particularly its intercultural dimensions. I sometimes think I should have been a modern foreign language teacher. But it would help to be able to speak another language. So that's, that's, that's holding me back. But, but I do, I do uh, take an interest in foreign language. So, from drama and the arts um, perspective, I think uh, this broad notion and Manfred's use of small scale and large scale. Really, um, sorry, I've jumped to you inclusively. Uh, the first one, but this was from his talk this morning as well, and his article that he wrote, linking drama with the other art forms. That came across in the book very much, um, the, the contributions from around the world. The importance of integration, and I think he said this morning that theatre is best placed to draw the others in, and I think that's very, very true. And also, the inclusive view of drama education, where small scale, large scale. Because if we look at a continuum from the very simplest, spontaneous, improvised paired exercise to stage performance, process drama is the term that's sort of quite predominant. But for me, process drama, I've never been that comfortable with the term because it seems to still put some parameters around drama practice. I like the notion of performative because it's more uh, inclusive within the drama fraternity or whatever. That's sexist, isn't it? Oh, I'm back in the 1970s, sorry. Uh, Back to the Pied Piper example. You know, it, it made such an impact on me, that work with Gavin Bolton. When I, years later, became a teacher trainer doing the same drama course, I always started with the Pied Piper example. But I developed it um, in different ways. We didn't start off with pairs exercise. We started off with a freeze frame, a tabla, because it was more constructed. It gave the message that this is an aesthetic construct. It's not just racing around. And I didn't want the... Because if the drama students, and they were teachers from 
quite often modern foreign languages, history, if they got the idea that drama is just dramatic planning, it would be real, without form and structure, it would be real recipe for problems in, in, in the past. And I also always finish that project with a piece of performance about a town bereft of its children. Um, so I sought to make it, and I'm not saying it was a deviation from Gavin Bolsover, I think it was in his tradition what he would have been doing years on. We're familiar with the polarities between traditional and progressive. <coughs> we know, I said this morning, you know, progressive education really started at the turn of, you know, from the 1900s, uh, uh, emphasizing the growth of the child, often emphasizing self-expression, creativity, and a lot of wonderful, of course, challenging authoritarian, sort of barbaric Victorian practices, quite rightly. Um, but also taking wrong terms uh, in some ways. And I like the notion of performative teaching and learning. I'm sure you could add to this, but I like the way it places the notion of action to the fore. Sort of not necessarily literally, but metaphorically. You know, that I can be active mentally sitting down. You know, uh, that, that's what I like about it. So it's more dynamic than static. But it emphasizes the social communal, communal rather than the individual. Deep rather than surface learning. The notion that learning takes time, that it's not a quick fix. A holistic rather than that of to be Imports of context and spring. And just a little warning there. Of course, I, I, you know, I realise what I'm doing here. I am loading it. But if we look at some of the theoretical perspectives on performance, it's not perhaps so far-fetched. Final point. Um, performance and teaching and learning culture. We use the word culture quite a lot. Um, it was Suzanne who talked about post-pedagogy, wasn't it, the term? Um, post, yeah, post-method pedagogy. Um, in one of the workshops, uh, Kezo, I hope I pronounced the right, was doing some reader's theatre, and it struck me that that way of working was very, very appropriate to the context. Um, Warren's workshop talked about the massive number of variables in the classroom. Um, and I think what went wrong in, there was a lot of good about progressive education, but what I saw go wrong in my lifetime, sometimes teachers grabbed a methodology and tried to apply it in a context, and it backfired on them. And I saw young teachers do it. <coughs> and those of you who have teached trainers might have seen that happen. You grab an exciting idea, you go to, to, to and, and try it out, and it doesn't work, and then you think, this is all rubbish, I'm going back to the way I want to start. Of course, we have to talk about methodology, but somehow, it's the culture of the classroom. And if you put emphasis on the culture of the classroom, and creating the right culture of the classroom, where it's okay to ask questions, you're not frightened of, um, um, of making mistakes, there's trust, there's openness, Sort of the methodologies sort of take care of themselves. Not entirely. Of course, we have to keep evolving new methodologies and so on. But without the right culture, no methodology will work. So I think performing teaching and learning culture, we can put the emphasis on culture as well quite usefully. Thank you very much for listening. Mm -hmm. Hi there, thank you, that was really great. Um, my research is about the kind of pro pro proliferation of terms that has evolved since the 1990s, particularly around applied theatre and moving to other umbrella terms. And my question is, in your opinion, do you think we've also overloaded the term drama and education and what have been the consequences of that for the field, if you have any comment on that? That's a really, really good question. I think <laughs> perhaps, yes, overloaded it in a sense. I think we've created confusion 
with the term drama in education. Because for some people it means drama, brackets, or whatever, in education. For some people it's drama in education, drama, you know, mm. hyphen, or one term. And drama in education came to me in the, well, 70s, this particular kind of living through practice. Um, and that caused a lot of confusion mm. from the outs to the outside world. I know myself when I, you know, going way back from where I started when I was in 1972. And I'd say I was doing drama in school. Like, what, what have you put on? <laughs> so, and I'd sort of, well, not shamefacedly, I'd sort of it would make it even worse by defiantly say, oh, it's not about that. It's a, what's it about then? Well, it's about sort of learning and understanding. And, <laughs> What? <laughs> you know, so we didn't, I suppose in some ways we didn't do ourselves too many favours with the use of the terminology there. Um, and you're right about the proliferation, you know, we have a client theatre mm. and so on. So, so yes, yes, you're right. I mean, um, those of you who are really interested in drama and the drama in education, the practice so on, I don't know if Many of you know David Davis at all, um, he's in Birmingham. He's got a new book coming out, and it's a book all about living through drama as being the only type of drama that makes any sense to do. So that's going to be provocative. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Very provocative. He asked me to do an afterward for it, and Gavin did a forward. Mm -hmm. We're all colleagues, we're all friends, going right back to the early 70s. Uh, so I did. <laughs> but it was tricky. Mm -hmm. I wasn't sure I agreed with it, mm -hmm. but I somehow wrote something honest that he was happy with. Mm -hmm. But it, it's going to be provocative, and I think the drama education world, the sort of process, sure. it needs a bit of provocation. I agreed, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, <laughs> I wanted to, uh, I was very interested in what you had to say also this morning, uh, you know, at the, the forum, and I suppose we didn't get a chance to say one or two things there, yeah. so yeah, I yeah. wanted to comment. Um, I'm running the Teaching and Learning Centre here. Uh, my colleague Betty Higgs was a geologist, and myself, uh, I have a background in the arts and humanities, and, um, and we've been, you know, I work with the drama and theatre studies as well here, but I'm very interested in bringing the two together. And I, when you were doing the lexicon this morning on performance, Manfred, and also in the light of what you were saying, um, like I think one of the th there are so many views of understanding and teaching and learning, but we have that the contrast. I love the work of um, David Perkins and Howard Gardner and the multiple yeah. intelligences and teaching for understanding. And I was wondering. What you thought, I think Perkins' view as well is really useful when he talks of performance, the performance view of understanding as opposed to the possessive view. Yes. And the traditional one, we have the possessive view where I, the lecturer, kind of know it all and I pass it on to you, the student, yes. who takes the notes. Now, I know that's caricaturing a little. Whereas the performance view says, like Miles Davis, play what's not there. In the doing, in the jamming, in the spontaneity, in the making is... Uh, the understanding, and I think that's the performativity we are talking about as we were doing this morning in the, um, I have all kinds of ideas how we do that better, <laughs> but anyway, the second one. Uh, but I just think that that's also very useful, you know, uh, what I like, I suppose, uh, Manfred, about the work is the idea of bringing the synergy of it together, because teaching and learning more contemporary theories, like of the, the performance view of it, um, is is really what you know the, the dialogical is, is what you want in any classroom and i have a very serious worry about for example next week we head in this country into the leaving cert and thousands of students will have spent this weekend coming in grind schools all over the city learning uh, stuff by heart by rote that they don't understand that they will never use again and we are playing into this narrow exam system as you said this morning where, uh, you know, and where things are being dumbed down and where we are not thinking enough of the fact that self-assessment, peer assessment, the communal 
is so important. And I suppose, um, I think that this will be a very interesting uh, movement that the idea of performativity embraces um, you know, the holistic, where the holistic is always greater than the sum of its parts, and where, as someone said this morning, the complex human being can never be reduced, um, you know, and human action, I suppose, the whole thing as well of dran, the meaning of the word to do uh, and to perform. So I think the whole thing is, is really exciting, and, uh, but, uh, you know, and I love the way I, I can, I have, by the way, great memories, I have to I tell a tiny anecdote about one of the first workshops we had here in the 1970s, uh, I was there. I did the Leave and Start the year you were doing uh, that PGC course. Anyway. So that dates me, but I'm still very young. Um, but anyway, <laughs> Cecily O'Neill and Gavin Bolton yeah. were here, and they did a workshop in the Crawford Gallery. I don't know whether anyone else in the room yeah. was at it. But I had to be a mouse on Miss Havisham's cake. And to this day, I will never forget it, the experience of being the mouse on the cake and exactly the detail you give about, you know. The, but, and it was th that time um, uh, when Gavin Bolton was, when we were talking about as well, trying to find words, you know, the drama was like more the doing and the showing and yeah. the whole thing of drama yeah. on one end and theatre on the other, you know. But I think the performativity grasps the best of both and allows us, as you say, to be flexible. So sorry, it's more a whole long comment and enthusiasm. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad it didn't turn into a question. Because it was too rich, what you were saying was, was, was too rich. I mean, this thing in the, the contemporary world we live in, it's, I suppose I, I sound a little bit negative this morning about the UK. And I'm, I wish I'd been sort of a bit more positive because I think what's going on, the testing is the main enemy, I think, because it's affecting the curriculum. But there is all the time a steady development of ideas. And interestingly enough, Ofsted, you all have heard of Ofsted, is often quoted as a big sort of enemy of teachers and so on. A lot of the good writing about teaching and learning is coming from Ofsted. That, that Ofsted documents, actually, that complicates it all. There's a lot in what they're writing about. There must be more space for learners in the classroom, and sometimes teachers are working at a too fast a pace and so on. So there's something going on about ideas continuing to flourish despite the yeah. surface very dire political situation we're in at the moment. Mm -hmm.